England vs India The Cricket Badger Test Match Daily Podcast Can Joe Root's England dominate on home soil? Five mouth-watering test matches Can Virat Kohli's India conquer the final frontier? Loving to talk test cricket every day It's the Cricket Badger. It's James bringing you the Cricket Badger podcast. And as always, it's our England against India test match dailies. I have to confess something to you before we start today. I have been working on football pretty much all afternoon and evening. So I am very reliant on my fan badges to bring us the flavour of the game as we go through this podcast. I know the scores. India obviously finishing on 181 for six. They lead by 154 runs as we, well, embark on day five tomorrow. And it looks like England are on top of this fixture. Um, Joined by Mark, Abai and Anand today on the podcast. Good to have you with me, gentlemen. Um, Let's start with you, Abai. Um, I asked you before we came on air, England on top of this game. Your answer was yes, wasn't it? Absolutely. Uh, Right now, uh, England is ahead. Uh, Even though uh, India's hopes are still there on Rishabh Pant. So they'd hope Pant strikes it well, uh, makes a quick fire 50 for them. And then uh, they ask England to probably chase around 220, 250. That's what India would like. But uh, as of now, uh, England have their noses ahead. I did some research the other day in a rather light-hearted manner, Abai. Um, I, I put into Google long-tailed animals. And I think I got an Asian grass lizard or something came up as uh, probably proportionate to its body, has the longest tail. And India are kind of like that a little bit, aren't they? As you say, Rishabh Pant is shouldering a lot of the burden of trying to extend that lead because... Shami, Bumra, um, Ishant and uh, Mohamed Siraj are not necessarily capable of adding too many. Yes, Ishant can play a little. Sometimes he can play gritty innings, but expecting him to bat is uh, baffling. So, uh, <laughs> yes, I don't support uh, that decision to, you know, play, um, have a longer tail. I, I would have gone for more batters. And that's why uh, me and Anand uh, would have wanted uh, Ravi Ashwin to play in place of one of the seamers. Which one to drop was a difficult one. I agree, like we discussed yesterday. But then that would have given a little more depth. Now Jadeja has uh, has been taken by Moin quite cheaply. And now India is in a problem. Because Anand, this tail is long, isn't it? I don't think I've... No- is there a longer tail in the in the history of Test match cricket that you can think of? Because we've got, I think, the best average amongst the four is about ten point five, eleven, or somewhere in that region. Jasper average is the least at three point something. But you wouldn't want to uh, bet your house on them achieving too much at the uh, the rear end of this innings, would you? I mean, long tail it is, but. Come on, let's give them some kudos for some entertaining batting. I mean, if you've seen Shami get out there, Shami's you, got to swing with his eyes closed. You've right? got a very strange definition of what's entertaining. <laughs> well, and then Shami's going to be there. I think Siraj is in the same mold. So, you know, after Ishant, who's the resident blocker, like Abai just mentioned, the the others are, you know, interesting. And Ishant, at the very best, could be called a very decent number 11. So the others, you can understand, are uh, you know, from their batting ability, are just far out the order there. Yeah, I mean, I, I saw on Twitter the other day there may be 10, 11, 12, 13 in, re, in reality. Maybe even 11, 12, 13, 14 if you're going to be a really harsh. Mark, um, from the flip side of this, you're our only English fan on this podcast tonight, but the, um, the Rishabh Pant danger, his potential effect, if he can get a little bit of resistance out of the tail and do his stuff that we know he can do, they could still extend this league, couldn't they, India, and could cause England some problems because they wouldn't want to chase too many on the final day. Well, that's right. I mean, I think if Pan bats for an hour or so, and um, well, if he bats for 90 minutes, and they'd probably have a lead of 230, 240 by then anyway. So Pan's perfectly capable of um, knocking the ball about, even if it's a new ball. In fact, with a new ball, he's more likely to take it on 
rather than yeah. the old one in some respects. So, so he's a very dangerous batsman, but he always gives you a chance. You know, you always feed in the game with him, particularly in English conditions. So, I think England will be obviously wary of trying to trying to make sure they have fields that restrict into singles where they can to attack the other bat to attack the other batters uh, to attack the tail. Uh, try and not not letting farm the strike too much at uh, the end of all at the end of end of the overs, obviously. Um, but I think we I, saw we saw in the first innings, Jadeja had the similar kind of position, didn't he, with the tail for India? And I don't think he necessarily managed that particularly well. He didn't really hit the big shots, and he didn't re- rotate the strike. And gradually, he lost partners, and in the end, India were all out. I mean, Alex has just come on. You can. Any of the uh, the listeners out there, watchers out there, you can make your comments. You can ask us questions as we go through this podcast. Alex has made a point really more than anything. He says, I wouldn't want us to chase more than 210, is his view, Mark. Um, I mean, even, even 154, which is the current lead, could be problematic with a bad start, couldn't it? Well, yeah, of course it can. I mean, absolutely anything over 200 is going to be a, be a tough chase. I mean... Historically, on the last days, so it's very difficult to get get that get get those runs, particularly Lords. But um, in I mean, India. I mean, the two guys have mentioned it there. There's no Ashwin in the side, and I think that could come back to haunt them because tonight Moen did get a little bit of turn. The pitch is slow; it is dry. Hmm. You know, if England got to if the India get a lead of two twenty two thirty, Ashwin, as well as being able to take wickets, is a very difficult bowler to get away. He can bowl well in all conditions. So, I don't think Jadeja, obviously, is not, I don't think he's as good a bowler as Ashwin. Probably hasn't got the control of Ashwin. So, they may lose control of the game, India, if, you know, because they've not got Ashwin in the side. So, I think England are the slight favourites, if I'm if I'm being honest with you. I think they are the slight favourites tomorrow. And actually, if they're chasing, you know, 210, 220 in, I don't know, 70 overs... Sometimes a shorter chase is actually better than a long chase, psychologically. No, I agree. I agree. So. Um, good evening to Sajad. He's been in touch on the on the messages. He says, hi. Um, he says he's from Pakistan. He loves England. Um, well, good to have you with us, Sajad, as we go through uh, tonight's podcast. Abai, uh, talk about Ashwin there. I found it baffling from an English perspective. Um, after the winter, I know these are different surfaces, but... England have a fear of spin and they have a fear of Ashwin because they know what he can do. And a lot of the games played in the head. I think it would have been an asset for India to have Ashwin even on an unturning track because they they have a lot of respect for him. And certainly on a track which is turning a little bit towards the end at Lords, which Lords can do, Ashwin could be a real handful for England because I think a lot of the batsmen are beaten against him before they even start. Very much. Uh, I find it very baffling as well. I am a very uh, big fan of Ravi Ashwin. And uh, the reason I really like him is because uh, he's mentally very tough. Mm. As we saw in the uh, uh, series uh, uh, down under uh, when India won the series, there was always you know, uh, this thought that Ashwin will be stronger against the left-handers. But yeah. he did so well against Smith and Labushane. Badges are furry creatures. 85% of women badges think bad grooming is a major turn-off. 80% of women badges think men should trim below the belt. 89% of men think good grooming is essential to the professional success. Don't just dismiss it out of hand. Get on there, manscaped.com. Check out their great range of male grooming accessories. Hygiene, appearance, attractiveness, confidence. Simply go to manscaped.com. Quote the discount code BADGER. You get 20% off, you get free shipping, and you get some seriously quality equipment. Manscaped.com. Together, we save balls. Don't you think sometimes, Abai? I mean, I know there is that uh, thing with spin where you're moving it one way, you potentially have a better record against right-handers or left-handers, depending on your your type of bowling. But if you're a good spinner, you cause anybody trouble, don't you? Absolutely. His dodgy innings uh, to save the test match at Sydney. So, so the mental toughness aspect, I'm sure with the kind of person Ashwin is, he can actually support... Uh, Virat with a lot of good thoughts as well during 
uh, a long test match like these. So uh, Ashwin is a must-have for me as well. Uh, team management would have thought something, but now uh, after hearing Mark as well, uh, and all of us have realized Moin got the ball to turn as well. So we feel even more uh, dejected that why Ashwin is not playing. And he's a dodgy batter as well. So this long tail question could have also been solved. I wonder as well with the, the third test at Headingley, um, how Indy will approach that, Anand? Because there is a um, a perception with Headingley that it is a seamer's paradise. It's not anymore. It's actually a very good batting track. And often the spinners get a lot out of that track. If India go in without really getting a good look at the recent test matches there, they could be lulled into the same mistake again. I mean, it's certainly possible because Kohli's comments have mentioned that he likes the way the attack is structured right now. Now, I think some of the decision-making is centered on what happened in the past. So if you think about the last Lord's Test that we had in 2018, we turned up with two spinners. Kuldeep Yadav was the second spinner. And it turned out to be a green wicket. It was overcast the whole time. Great humidity. Ball was swimming around, hooping around. And there was no real point to having that second spinner. However, I think this is slightly different. You know, when we looked at the weather at Lord's, when we knew what what was going to be out there looking at the pitch. It wasn't a terribly green pitch. At that point, I think, you know, maybe there, there should have been some thought given to Ashwin. I s- almost suspect they've gone back to look at statistics and seen what has happened in the past. Uh, with Headingley, I mean, you know, I think they need to again take a look at this and see how are the bowlers shaping up and see whether Ashwin can be accommodated. Because apart from the fact that Ashwin is just, to me, the best spinner in the world right now, Ashwin also gives a little bit with the bat. And while you might say that that's... It's, it's more than a little bit with the bat, isn't it? He? he can hold a bat properly, whereas the other four that we're talking about can't, can they really? Well, the man's a tinker. So if you look back at his early batting exploits, he actually got a couple of centuries. I think he might have got a century in uh, West Indies or so. He, 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 he can really bat, but he tinkered with this technique so much that, you know, in the last couple of years, things sort of changed. But I felt in Australia, again, he tinkered back and made some changes and looked a little more confident. So uh, Ashwin is just that thinking man's cricketer, right? So he's always tweaking, changing things around. So I think he could give something with the bat. So unless it's a green seamer and we know that it's going to be, you know, there's a prospect of rain, humidity is going to be high, you know, maybe it's time to take a look at Ashwin. I mean, you, you, you've uh, seen Headingley, Mark. It, it isn't the Headingley of the 80s, is it, where you pack the uh, attack with a load of trundlers and try and kind of just swing and, and nip, nip off the seam. It, it's actually yielded quite a lot of good batting and, and, and high scores in recent years. Yeah, it's a very, in some respects, it's a very similar pitch to Lords these days. It's quite slow, it's quite flat. Um, you know, there's big scores in county games, big scores in international games. Obviously, you've got the overhead, the overhead conditions, and it's cloudy, and there's a bit of moisture in the air. That, that can, that, but well, that can apply to all English grounds yeah. where it changes the conditions fundamentally. Because we know cricket's a game played by the weather and the environment, as we said the other day. But uh, yeah, Headingley, particularly this time of the year, mid-August, is likely to be a flat pitch. And also, England have asked. The, you know the grounds, the grounds, are, the grounds, the groundsmen to actually take grass off the wickets for this series. They don't want them as green as previous series because they want to get used to playing on flatter wickets when they get to Australia and when they go to subcontinent. So that's been a, a little bit of a bone of contention. Uh, we see, we've seen today, Mark, um, your namesake, Mark Woods, how important he can be on tracks like that because if you've got that added pace and he he's regularly now bowling at over 90 93 94 i saw somebody on the commentary early on today describe one of his balls as a slower ball when it was 89 or 90 or something <laughs> ridiculous it was it was bonkers but that extra pace is a threat on tracks like that isn't it yeah it's strange in our whatsapp chat when we talk about the cricket i said you know just before wood got his second wicket, i said now wood needs to make something happen you know he's a point of difference and just by luck he did. But, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of Marwood. I'm a big fan also of test sides having that point of difference within their side, mm. whether that be a mystery spinner or somebody with the express pace. Marwood can come on and he can have a burst of wicket and check burst of wicket and change a game. He's got that express pace and point of difference that the other bowlers don't have. And, I, I, and I don't care who you are, whether you're Rohit Sharma, Virat Kohli, anybody, nobody likes facing 93, 94 oh. miles an hour. The, I mean, the, the point in case today was Rowat. I mean, obviously they set the trap for him. Um, and Rowat got caught at, um, on the boundary at Trent Bridge playing a similar shot. Today he played the first, hit it. But they know that row hit kind of um, hooks off the front foot with low hands. Yeah. I mean, when you're hooking off the front foot with low hands, you can never be in control of the shot. 
I mean, that, that's that's the case, Abai, isn't it? Because I mean, Rohit's um, batting, Abai, is uh, one of his strongest suits is the pull and the hook. He makes so many runs. Uh, he, he, you know, he, he's a, a class act when it comes to that shot. But sometimes your strength can be your weakness. And England have sussed him out twice, as Mark said. And the, the shot today, I thought, when he, he got out, was silly Rohit Sharma because the plan was there. It was obvious what England were trying to do and they just suckered him into it. Absolutely. Um, so these kind of challenges, he will face a lot of them. It's it's this uh, short ball right now and it could be something else later. Uh, we have to understand that Rohit hasn't had a massive test, test match experience either. He's been more of a, you know, the the white ball specialist uh, or the white ball legend, you can call, for India. So he will go through these these things where, you know, bowlers will try to find him out in test match conditions in different parts of the world. Mostly he was part of the 15 uh, or he was bat- batting at number six. But I've been very impressed the way he has taken the opener's role right from the Australia series to the series. He's been scoring some good runs. Now he's got a problem. I, I know exactly what you're saying, and he has had that label of being a white ball specialist, but this is his 41st test match. He's a vastly um, experienced cricketer. It's not like you're taking some 17-year-old kid out there who's being suckered into this. This is a, a vastly experienced player. Correct. I did give this point a thought today, and maybe I'm wrong, but even though it's 45 one test matches, it's spread ac- across a lot of years. I think the continuity part has started... Uh, from a year onwards. Yeah. And this is his first major series in England as a regular playing 11. That's a fair uh, point. Personal. That is a fair point. Um, it was nice to see, from my perspective, I've got a lot of admiration for Cheteswar Pajara under a huge amount of pressure <laughs> in that Indian lineup at the moment. Made 45 in a little bit more of his kind of customary fashion, Abai. Um, and KL Rahul, the other man that's under pressure in that Indian side with 61. I, I mean, I wasn't watching that partnership. But I saw some of the comments on the WhatsApp group about, I think um, Knackle said, you can tell they're batting like they're under pressure, but they still stayed in there and got some runs today, which is a, a feather in their cap. Kudos to them. They will always be under pressure. If you're playing for India, you'll be under massive pressure always. One, you've got so many fans looking uh, at you, at your performances. Number two, there, there's so much of depth in Indian cricket right now that yeah. somebody else is always ready to take your place. So well, you, You've got 1.3 billion people there waiting to take the place, haven't you? Absolutely. So so these guys are under massive pressure already. For them, are, for Rahul to grab his opportunity in the first test match and now this test match as well, he scored 100 in the first innings. He missed out in the second innings. Uh, is, is great. He's been waiting in the wings for far too long. Everybody knows he's very good. But to really perform on your very first opportunity, because yeah. Mayank Agarwal got injured, was special. And again, today, Pujara and Rahane, I mean, uh, the sword was on their necks. But they did play well. They they did uh, uh, play a session without giving their wickets, which was great for Indian fans. Jacob and I sent the Badger a message and now I'm on the podcast with this jingle. If you would like to get in touch with the Cricket Badger podcast, then tweet at cricket underscore badger. Anand and Abai, I'll start with you Anand. It's um, Indian Independence Day today, isn't it? Happy Independence Day to both of you guys. Um, Is that a a major festival celebration? Is that something that you two... um, are going to be partying all the way through the night with, or is that something a little bit more subdued, Alan? Well, a couple of different ways to look at it. Since I moved to the US, it's been more of a culture. We actually have events that go on, you know, especially if it's over the weekend. Uh, yeah. If it's not on the weekend, we'll have some events on the weekend where you'll get a lot of the, there'll be cultural fairs and things like that. Uh, oftentimes, you know, I used to lead a nonprofit organization. We used to have events that centered around it as well. So more of a place to kind of meet up and, you know, kind of just celebrate where India is now compared to, you know, where we started. So, you know, it, it, it certainly is different growing up in India. I thought it was, again, a major, major day. Uh, schools used to be off. We used to have all sorts of different events and activities out there. So uh, certainly much bigger profile in India. But here I know that pretty much everybody does something around uh, the day and there's some sort of cultural significance to it. So would have been good to see a, a good uh, Indian repose today. But, I mean, you know, England played great. And, you know, you can yeah. only say well played to somebody who's done well. 
So, so what have you got planned today? Because you're in the US, aren't you? Um, so you're a little bit earlier than I am at the moment in the UK. Have you got anything planned for this evening? Uh, unfortunately, not this time. Usually uh, with with COVID and all, they're just, we're just taking a few precautions. Right now, uh, you know, in Atlanta, where I'm based, yeah. we're seeing about 7,000 cases a day or so. So things have sort of, you know, started to rise up again. So things are sort of slow this year and as well as last year they were. But previous years, we usually have something or the other, uh, you know, whether it's a flag hoisting ceremony at the Indian embassy or just uh, culture affairs like that. There, there used to be tons of activities around. I just think this time, a little low key. And Abba, you're, you're, I think you're an hour ahead of me in Sweden, aren't you? Which is where you're, you're based. I, I assume that I'm um, coming up towards nine o'clock there on the basis that you're on this chat, you're not going to have a wild night. No, no, uh, quite subdued. Uh, relate to whatever Anand has said, since we've also settled in Europe, uh, of course, there's a lot of excitement and some some, some festival kind of a scenario uh, somewhere in the country. But uh, no, we are quite subdued on it and very proud of the way country has grown from 1947 to this point, like what Anand also mentioned. So that's, uh, that always gives you a proud feeling. You always think about cricket as well, how much you've gone, grown in cricket as we are all badgers. So uh, feels good, but uh, not a holiday here. So it's anyway a Sunday. Hey. Well, from the uh, Cricket Badger podcast um, to all of the Indians watching this, have a very happy day, whatever you're planning to do. Whether you like uh, Anand and Abai and staying in or whether you have got anything planned, enjoy yourselves and have a good time. Mark, every day is a party day for you. I know you. I can see you're on the way out, I'm sure. Um, to uh, do something uh, probably sure. that we, we shouldn't sure. repeat. But um, getting back to the, the test match, all of you guys have been telling me that Moen's been getting a bit of turn at, uh, at Lords towards the end of today. I think Abai said that his, his wickets came from balls that maybe didn't turn so much. But is that a danger for England that maybe Jadeja might get a little bit from it? Because I know, I know he is renowned as a white ball bowler more than a red ball bowler, but his record in test cricket is pretty decent. Yeah, it is. I mean, he's he's a good, still a good bowler. We just said that Ravi Ashwin's probably the best spin bowler yeah. in, the, in the world. But as you know, Jadeja has got a very good good record in Test match cricket. I believe that most of his wickets have come on the subcontinent rather than abroad. But yeah, he's a fine bowler, and if it if it if it's turning, then he's obviously a threat. And he's also you know, he's also a, <coughs> you know, he's also got a lot of five wicket hauls in in second innings of Test matches. So so he's an obvious threat. Um, so yeah, he's a big threat, and, and Moen did turn it, did turn it tonight a little bit at the end of the day. And I think England at last have realised, as we were saying on the podcast last week, that that all seam strategy, if they'd have kept to that all seam strategy, which they were going to do up until Tuesday night, yeah, be right on the backside in this Test match. Moen's and I mean, Moen, Moen's a class act. I mean, we talked about him not playing Red Bull since February and stuff, but you know, class is permanent kind of thing, isn't he? He's a good, good cricketer. And he knows what he's doing with that ball. And he's got a good record against India, as everybody keeps saying. Uh, Anand, there's a, a point being made on the uh, on the chat uh, from Alex. Um, I think Pajara, the, the Pajara approach, he says, can hurt India on occasions because he puts pressure on the other batsmen. I mean, I, I guess you could say the same about the kind of Sibley approach for England. It puts pressure on the other batsmen to score runs. But I would say on a, on a day like today, where you are looking to bat long, a Pajara in your side doesn't do you any harm, does it? No, I actually think he batted great. And we actually need Pujara to do what he just did today. Uh, when we're looking at this third innings, after the first three wickets, we also need to bat time. And this is the strength of Pujara's, right? So I think that we actually need Pujara there because the team is surrounded by players who can who can really hit their strokes. So KL Rahul, Rohit Sharma, Virat Kohli, Rahane for that matter, and Pant and Jadeja. Each and every one of them can up the ante when necessary. To me, Pujara is actually great and he is the foil who allows other stroke make- makers to flower around him. Even today, I think Pujara would, got 45-odd runs and 200-odd balls. But in the meantime, Rahane, once he got in, had started to up the ante, was trying to rotate the strike and things like that. So I think the solidity that Pujara provides is very important. I think where things have changed for Pujara is, typically he slots out slow. But as he starts to catch up, you'll see more and more strokes and more, more and more shot making. And you would see some of those bigger tons. What has changed in recent times is Pujara is getting to about 50, 50, 60 odd, and then he gets out. And I think that's sort of hurting some of his perceptions because that's typically when he starts to accelerate and he hasn't been able to do so. Part of that, I would say, is he's played New Zealand in New Zealand, yeah. England in England, Australia in Australia. And then, uh, you know, obviously England in India. But even then, I think Leach 
Well, particularly beautifully to Pujara. Yeah, I mean, both both India and England have had a, a bit of a crazy run against tough opposition, haven't they? With England obviously going to Australia in the winter, um, it doesn't get too much easier, I don't think, with that. You are listening to the Cricket Badger Podcast. Uh, let's finish off. I want to talk a bit about county cricket. I know me and Mark have got rather different views on this. There was a, a piece in the Daily Mail, I think, today about how... 12 of the 18 counties are voting or prepared to vote in favour of retaining the conference style system in the county championship for an, at least another year to see how it goes, rather than revert back to the, the first, second division setup that we've had in the past. Um, obviously, the conference system was primarily brought in because of COVID um, and the chance to get well, last year a short Bob Willis trophy into the summer so they could actually have some red ball cricket for four days. Um, and then obviously it was retained this season as well. We've got very different opinions on this, Mark, haven't we? Because I'm in favour of this conference and I, I think the conference is a good thing in that it gives everybody, all of the 18 counties, an opportunity to win the thing uh, and potentially can raise the standards across the board. You've got a completely contrary view to that, haven't you? Yeah, I have in many respects. I think... <clears throat> Initially, the conference was... I think, I think just the word yes would have been enough there. <laughs> yes, I have got a different view. I think the conference was fought up last year on a women, a pandemic. You know, they had the Bob Willis trophy and they thought, oh, this is a... a some, of the, some of the best days I've had have been on a win, Mark. Some some of the yeah, best sorry, decisions well, I've ever made. No yeah. real, I don't think it was really fought through. And I think it's the usual thing. Let's change the first-class game. Let's change the format, this and the other. And I don't think it's benefiting first-class cricket. It's, it's breeding mediocrity. You, I mean, you say, you say that, and I had a conversation earlier on today with somebody. I actually think it's potentially breeding, <clears throat> what's, the, what's the opposite of mediocrity? Excellent. Excellent. Um, because I, I think at the moment you've got a two-tier structure and you've got the likes of Leicestershire and some of the other counties who have effectively settled for being in the second oh. division of the championship. And then they... Um, because they don't see the championship as being that important, that's kind of shoved to one side and they invest it more in their white ball teams because that's where they can win trophies. And Leicestershire have done that in the past. The Leicester Foxes have, um, I think, still the, the, the most decorated T20 blast side in the county game. North Hans have won the T20 blast and probably gone down that route a little bit at times as well. But I, I, I think when they see that th- this is going to be a longer term thing and that at the start of each season they do have the potential to get at least get into that top division, if not win the thing. It does give those sort of counties a little bit more of an incentive to actually think, right, let's get some Red Bull players into this team. Let's see if we can actually do something in this competition. Um, I disagree. I think I, <laughs> I, thought you might. I don't think there's enough quality in the English game at the moment for um, to sustain it. I think you need the best playing the best if you want to improve standards, essentially. I think when you look, when England had a very strong Test match side between the between the years of around two thousand and you know when when, sec, when two divisions come around between two thousand and one two thousand and two, and central contracts came around and it was played at the right times and could wickets in two divisions, England actually produced a very strong side. Um, played produced lots of batters, lots of bowlers, um, who all went through that particular system. So in the last five or six years, when the red ball's been marginalised to the end of the season and it's been messed about with and pitches have got worse, that, that's been eroding away. And I see the conference as a further erosion of that. I don't think... Don't, don't, don't you think, though, that the marginalisation and what is evident to me as being um, the red ball becoming secondary and, and the white ball ball becoming obviously the cash cow and, and, and more lucrative and therefore taking these summer months in July and August. That's the problem, not not the structure of the championship. And the, I mean, in a way, the conference or the, the, the first and second division setup is almost irrelevant because if you're going to stick the championship in April and May and stick it in the at the other end of the season in September and October or whatever, whatever you do, whatever structure you have, you're kind of lowering the standards regardless, aren't you? Well, yeah, that, there, is, well, there is that problem. I, I absolutely agree with that, that the actual structure and when it's played is ridiculous. And I think that will be looked at at some point in time, particularly now there's more pressure from people like Root, Stuart Broad in the paper today, all those types of people beginning to talk about it. But I really don't think... I mean, even, even, even Tom Harrison, to be fair to him, in what I thought was an awful interview on Sky, 
where he blamed COVID for everything and looked a bit sweaty and a bit edgy. He Even he admitted that the structure is not ideal this summer. So hopefully the ECB will try and do something at least about that next summer. It's going to be well, interesting to say, I mean, it'd be interesting to know which 12 counties want the conference system. If it is, I mean, in your head, I'm sure you've got a hierarchy of who is probably first division down to 18th, maybe being Leicestershire or Derbyshire or whoever. Um it would be interesting to know if it was the bottom 12 that had voted for the conference and the top 12, top I six. Who... I mean, for me, there's not enough quality. There's 475 professionals in the English county grade. Mm-hmm. I think that's too many full-time professionals, if I'm being perfectly honest with you. There's not enough quality. There's a lot of poor cricket. I don't, I don't want reduced counties. Sp- but sp- see... spread, the, spread the net wide. Make sure you get as many potential quality players in as possible. Maybe, but a lot of these players are finished in the mid twenties. It's not fair for them. They don't have great careers, and then they've got nothing. I just think we need. The oh, best. So you're you're saying to me that a 26 year old journeyman county professional who's enjoying a, 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 an average county career should just be chopped off and told to go out to pass? Yeah, I'm not saying that. They may, I'm not saying that. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't say that that person should be a full time professional cricketer. I'm not saying he shouldn't be a cricketer. I'm not saying he can't play cricket, but I really don't think it's the quality to sustain nearly 500 full-time professional cricketers in the UK, particularly when it's not being played in state schools, particularly when we've got decreasing participation. That might change in future years, who knows? But we need the best playing the best on good wickets. And I don't see how a conference system where counties don't have much to play for after the middle of July will do that. Uh, if you look well, at I'm going to have the last word on this discussion because it's my podcast. <laughs> but I, I, I think that the conference system actually could potentially raise the standards across the board. And I think most of the things you said are actually structural problems and are actually, if we actually invest in the county game, if we play in the in the right months of the season, if we actually have championship cricket all the way through the summer to support the international team above, um, a lot of the things that you say in terms of raising the standard would actually automatically not necessarily completely heal themselves but they would it would get better and it would look better and i think fans would enjoy it i think yeah we see so many fans i see so many comments on twitter i've just seen a match at old trafford for example in may and this is the last time i'm going to see a county championship match in manchester until august there's something or other and that has got to be wrong we've got counties who are out the royal london one day cup who at the moment have got fit and firing cricketers who want to play the game spectators that want to watch them and there's three weeks without cricket being played um for even home home or away for those teams and that has never disagree with that i just don't think the conference is the way to go down if you look at who's at the top of the conferences now it's test match grounds first division clubs it's just reproduced. It will be. It will be Mark initially because they are the teams that have got the better squads at the moment because they've been in Division One. But what I'm what I'm suggesting is, if you actually stick with this conference system for a while, you will encourage the teams further down the food chain to actually take it more seriously and become better and try and compete with those top guys. And I don't think that as an ambition is a bad thing in the county game. And that is the last word. You're not coming back at me. You're not coming back at me on this time because we're going to move back onto the Test match. Lords, day five, um, India taking that lead into the final day. Abai, where do we stand now in terms of your prediction on who's going to win this game? This time, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to take uh, predict on basis of what, what where the match really stands. I'm actually thinking India is going to win. So you're just uh, going to basically let your heart rule your head on this one. Yes, yes, I think so. I think. Uh, Probably we are in for a collapse, but somewhere my mind tells me that uh, can India take Joe Root cheaply? Let's see. Answer to that's no, isn't it? On the evidence of what we've seen so far, but we'll we'll find out, won't we? Tomorrow, yeah. 154 runs ahead, and and um, say the say the last four wickets fell in a massive heap tomorrow, and the lead was 170. Could you see India winning on that basis? Well, if you think about it, like you mentioned yesterday, India needed 158 runs to win in the first test, and you clearly said that England's on top. So, I mean, now India's 154 runs ahead. I say India's on top, isn't it? Same logic. This is a lesson to your listeners. Never put anything on Twitter or never put anything out in public because it comes back to bite you. People like Anand have long memories. Talk about parity, by the way. 150-odd, you know, both four days are finished and that's where we stand. But I think England certainly are slightly ahead at this point. If Ashwin was there... I actually think India was still in with a fair chance with even a small total, with the pitch being the way it is. With Ashwin mm. being out of the picture, if India collapse 
quickly, I think England certainly on top. So well, I, I've been going for the draw all the way through our, our broadcast so far. Um, I struggle to see how this one can be a draw now from where we are, um, particularly with India's tail. It's not like India can bat for maybe three hours and take it deep into the afternoon. So it has to be a positive result one way or the other. I would be nervous with England chasing, say, 220 or more. As Alex said earlier on his comment, I think that would be a challenge for England. But I reckon England's maybe just slightly ahead, as Anand says. So I'm going to go with England. Mark, are you in the English camp or the Indian camp? Um, I think England are slight favourites. I think no Ashwin, no party, essentially. They're going to really miss Ashwin tomorrow. Um, not so, His wicket-taking ability, but his control as well. I think they might miss that in the middle of the afternoon. Yeah, I, I won't rule out the draw. I mean, Indians last four wicket could back to lunch yet. You don't know, do you? So all three results are possible. But as it stands at the moment, if England use the new ball, if Anderson turns up tomorrow... If India's last four wickets back to lunch, I will change my mind on the conference system, Mark. <laughs> yeah, England are the slight favourites, but who knows? I mean, it's been a great test match, that's all I can say. I mean, and that is the bottom line, and that's how we're going to end today because we have had four days of absolutely superb test match cricket and we have a day five ahead of us where which could go any which way. None of us know at the moment, and that's the beauty of this game. You get these sways in ascendancy. You get one team on top. You get Root knocking it all over the place. Then India bounce back, and it has been a terrific test match, and that is why we all love test, test match cricket. And um, Whether you're Indian or England, uh, English, you can't be not enjoying this game at Laws. It is absolutely fantastic. Mark, Abai, and Anand, as always, thank you very much indeed for joining me. Thanks for watching out there, everybody. Thanks for listening on the podcast, which will be out later as well. And uh, we will see you tomorrow after day five when we will know who has won or drawn or lost this test match at Lords. But it's been an absolute cracker. Enjoy the day tomorrow, enjoy the cricket. And we will see you tomorrow after day five at Lords. Thanks for listening. Join us after every day of this England versus India test series. We will see you again tomorrow.